Windows on the World live every Sunday, 9 to 11 p.m. GMT. Join me, Mark Windows, and Tony Hurst. Join the conversation in our chat box and also catch up with life-changing information on our continuous program stream at windowsontheworld.net. Welcome to Windows on the World. Follow us on Spreaker and also YouTube while we're still here. And of course we're on BitChute as well. We're live every Sunday, 9 to 11 p.m. at windowsontheworld.net. And you can join in the chat box there. The show's going very well and we're picking up a lot of listeners. So we're still making videos. I'm here with Piers Corbyn and we're going to talk about the mini ice age. It's going to be the subject of one of our shows. So many reports are predicting a mini ice age. We've seen this in the mainstream media. Projections say temperatures could be dropping by 2021. Piers thinks this may have already started to happen, but the Guardian called it a myth. <laughs> now, decreasing magnetic waves for three solar cycles, stated by one scientist, said that this could last for 33 years, the actual solar minimum and it's Professor Zarkovska said that there's 97 percent oh the 97 percent again accuracy for for a model dovetailing with previous mini ice ages that she's looked into uh, which obviously corresponds to the Maunder minimum which is in 17 1645 to 1715 and here's a few quotes before we go over to Piers Zarkova said I hope that global warming will be overridden by this effect, so she's saying that the global warming is happening, uh, giving humankind and the Earth 30 years to sort out its pollution. Uh, and the grand solar minimum would temporarily reduce global temperatures by less than 0.3 degrees centigrade, while humans are causing 0.2 degrees centigrade. Yes, yeah, see, the problem with this professor saying these things is that although she's done work about showing that, you know... The, climate is changing due to the sun she suddenly drops in the belief but she's got no evidence that the belief of the co2 driver is there at all and i suspect he's after funding which is very sad uh, the truth is that carbon dioxide levels are beyond the control of man anyway and furthermore the levels themselves do not have any impact i repeat any impact on climate but just to get the levels straight, we've got a little diagram here. The fact is, and all, all sides will agree this, that there is 50 times more carbon dioxide in the sea than there is in the air. OK, now that means, uh, and there's going to be a level between them, and the level, uh, the balance level between the two of them is the saturation level of CO2 in the air will depend on the temperature of the sea. You warm up the sea a bit, like warm up a glass of water, some gases will come off, nitrogen, oxygen, carbon dioxide will come off. You cool down a glass of water and it can absorb more of those gases. That's very straightforward, very simple and very basic physics. Because there's 50 times more CO2 in the sea than in the air, it means basically whatever man does to the air will have no effect because the CO2 will compensate. If man puts extra CO2 into the air, or nature, or termites, or anybody puts CO2 into the air, it will just go into the sea, depending on the sea's temperature. And if you take it out of the air, then it will come out of the sea. And the levels will stay the same according to what's called Henry's Law, gives you the equilibrium levels um, of a, a, a liquid and a gas uh, at a certain temperature. So. The CO2 theory is wrong from the start. Even if you believe the CO2 is having an impact, the CO2 levels can't change under man's influence. It's, the fact is, the sun rules the sea temperature and the sea temperature rules the climate. So, why do they keep getting it so wrong? It's all down to the IPCC, which is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. We know that. But this is a very simple way of looking at it, mm. and it, it's, it's easy to explain. And even in that court case we're talking about, the, these things could have been brought in and they would have been less confusing to the judge, I think, if he'd have listened to you before and then, <laughs> well, or somebody else. Let's right? hope he'll invite me. <laughs> yes, but the point is that the, just relying on this IPCC data is even to me because as a layperson I can see that it's flawed because it's all about models and projections and none of them have come true and they're often wildly out and of course they've been caught really basically we could say fraud it's actually a fraudulent data uh, principle that they're using but where does this tie into the mini ice age appears? Well 
it ties into the mini ice age because what we have actually happening now is the start of the mini ice age. I mean, in a way, if you like, it began around 2013, but it's a slow start and now the rate of, of moving into the mini ice age is accelerating. Uh, the basic thing is you have a, uh, a wild jet stream, uh, but in the immediate sense, if you look at recent weather, we've had this winter and spring, we've had extreme cold, we've had record snow levels, a uh, hundred year records have been broken in America, um, all over Europe, uh, all over the Northern Hemisphere, in, in, including China. And the Baltic Sea ice has is, is reached very high levels, world ice levels are now very high, both in the Antarctic and on Greenland. Now, of course, the BBC tells you about a bit of warming or milding which has happened in the Arctic, uh, the Arctic sea ice and so forth. However, these things are part of what we expect under the wild jet stream view of the mini ice age, which is something we've been saying since 2008. Now, under that, the jet stream, which under the global warming model is going to be way up to the north under the uh, mini ice age view of things when the solar activity goes down the jet stream uh, gets more wavy and moves further south. Okay so Piers has gone to get the globe and he's going to explain in a very very straightforward and simple way how this works. Yeah. Okay well this is the globe, the world and this is the jet stream which is west to east motion in the upper air of uh, winds and uh, when you've got a low pressure coming towards the British Isles for example the jet stream is essentially like that and that's the low pressure coming in. Um, now under normal circumstances in uh, spring say uh, the jet stream will be above the British Isles for example so it's mostly warm and it'll go up and down of course um, and under normal uh, views of the world under carbon dioxide, when it gets warmer the jet stream will go further north on average because the colder area is then reduced and the warmer area below the jet stream is bigger. Right? However, what we've got happening now is not that. The jet stream has not shifted north. What's happened is the average position of the jet stream is a long way south and it's furthermore got very wavy. When it's longer, it can get more wavy, but under low solar activity, it gets extra waviness. So what we have is a wild jet stream giving extreme rapid changes quite often, which is the wrong type of extremes for the man-made climate change story. This spring, we've had the jet stream, generally speaking, so far much too far south for the global warming story while we've had these cold spells. Under the global warming story it should be further north. That is not happening and as I said what we're seeing are the wrong type of extremes for the global warming story. We have confirmation of the mini ice age view of jet stream motion. Okay, so we can see how the jet stream predicts uh, the cooling, and now we're going to have a look at a very interesting and simple graph. Yes, this was produced by a man called Timo Naroma some years ago. He's since died, but what he did, he compared uh, the average smoothed out solar activity uh, in the last few hundred years with the average smoothed out solar activity. 10 magnetic cycles of the sun before that, i.e. 221 years before that. And you see an amazing correlation. I mean, this is a smoothed out correlation. It's not day to day or even year to year, but you know, three or four years by three or four years that it would show this type of thing. Uh, and we are at the knee of this curve now. So if you accept that this correlation is valid and will carry on, then it means we are plunging now deep into a mini ice age and there is no way out. So for the next uh, 20 years until 2035 it's going to get colder and colder on average and there will be an even more wild jet stream and more 
while temperature changes and it will be generally colder. And uh, the specific sort of things we can expect are more hail events and we predicted all these things in 2008 and they're all happening now. There will even be more earthquakes and extreme volcano events because historically those do coincide with periods of low solar activity and that will happen. There will be more snow in winters, uh, uh, lousy summers, uh, late springs and uh, short autumns and the economics of this will be more and more crop failures in Europe and farmers having to shift into, into different things. Um, the basic message is that the sun is controlling the climate primarily via the sea um, and the best thing to do now is to tell your politicians to stop believing nonsense and to stop uh, doing silly measures like bird killing machines of, 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 of wind farms in order to save the planet they say but get rid of all those things which cost money and reduce electricity prices now. Thank you. That's very good information and of course the first part of this show actually dealt with this court case in California where the oil companies and also the people who brought the case against the oil companies are using the same data which is inherently flawed and relies on models and projections and the judge actually did pull them up on that both sides including Miles Allen from Oxford University who was probably not purposefully exaggerating the data but the data appeared very exaggerated which it was so look out for us on windowsontheworld.net please join us on Spreaker every Sunday 9 to 11 p.m. we have a chat box you can get involved and keep liking our YouTube videos while they're there and also follow us on BitChute and we'll see you soon on Windows on the World. Windows on the World live every Sunday 9 to 11 p.m. GMT. Join me Mark Windows and Tony Hurst. Join the conversation in our chat box and also catch up with life-changing information on our continuous program stream at windowsontheworld.net.